Square. Good morning. How's everybody? Good, good, good. Yeah, so we're in the book of Song of Songs, Solomon. We're at chapter 6 today. And we're talking about the echoes of love that rekindle the heart. It's the echoes of love that rekindles the heart. I don't know about you, but when you read this book and you try to go line by line and precept by precept, as the scripture says we should, you're probably going to walk away with more questions than when you first started. Because the book is poetry. It's uh, about human expression. So the first question I will come across is, well, what does this book have to do with me? Because I always try to apply the scripture to my life and see how I fit in the scripture or how it fits to me. Now, we understand that Solomon is the description of God's love for his chosen people and also Christ's love for the church, also known as the bride. And the Sholemite woman, who is one of the main characters in the Song of Songs, is the description or the depiction of God's chosen people and the church, also known as the bride. So what the Song of Solomon tries to do, it tries to draw you closer into intimate communion with God. It's a love story. It's a love story. The whole Bible is a love story from beginning to the end. It's a love story with everything in between, right? all the mess that we see reading from book to book in between. So from Pastor Josh and all of those that have spoken alongside of him, like uh, Elder Dion and Matt Lucas. Matt Lucas stood up here and gave a testimony of, at one point in time, him and Christ weren't on speaking terms. And it was because of the love that was echoed through his wife that rekindled his heart to love Jesus again. The echo of love rekindles the heart. See, we have to love people from our relationship with Jesus and not from our mood. That's real love. That's how we rekindle the heart. It's not about how we feel. It's, it's the love of Christ that Christ has in us and for us that flows through and touches the hearts of other people. And then from Pastor Steve and Lori Rodder and Lori stood up here and gave her testimony of how she didn't even like herself at one point in time. But it was the intimate relationship and the love through the scriptures that shined a light on some darkness that was in her heart. And it was damaged emotions that caused her to not look at herself the way that God sees her. See, it was the love that was echoing through the scripture and through the word that rekindled her heart to love God once again in loving herself, as the scripture says, you, she got to love herself in order to love people. So it was the echo of that love that came through the scripture that caused her to love Christ yet again through the damaged emotions. So again, this is a love story that starts from beginning to end, and the book of Song of Solomon is just a acute, or it gives details of this love story. And if we can recap chapter four of this book, Solomon is just pouring on all sorts of compliments for the Sholemite woman. He starts in how beautiful she is and her eyes, her eyes are just like dove's eyes and her hair. Her hair is like a flock of goats coming down from the mountain of Gilead and her teeth. He says she has all of her teeth. It's a big thing, none missing. It's the simple words that seem to be the most effective, right? And then it's not just her physical beauty, but it's her character also. It's the character, and he's, it's the character that caused him to say, hey, come away with me. And as Pam Clark pointed out last week, um, it seemed to be some complacency in her response to the invitation to come along with him, to come away and be more intimate with him. Uh, you know, it sounds like from reading the scripture that She's like, well, I just got home from work. I just got comfortable. Uh, you know, I, I just washed my feet. And so by the time she's reluctantly getting up to go answer this call, he's gone. He moves away from her. So now she's feeling, oh no, what have I done? There's a separation here. She sends out a search party. 
She's, she's stressing. She can't sleep at night. Oh, no. I didn't answer the call fast enough. So now that brings us to chapter 6 today, what we're going to look at today. And chapter 6 starts off with appearance from none other than the women of Jerusalem. And they start by saying, where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? Listen, I don't know about you, and it's sort of difficult to figure out who, the show, who these uh, women of Jerusalem are, but they may very well could be the little foxes that are coming to steal the fruits off of the vine of this relationship in particular. Because when you start out with a, 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 a statement of, oh, most beautiful among women, why, why do they need to say that? To me, that's dripping with sarcasm. You know, today we would call them thirsty women, if you will. It's evident that these women are, are the little foxes because they're prying for information. They're, they're thinking, oh, is this love affair over with? Do we have a chance to get with the beloved? But they want to see how the Shulamite woman is going to respond. So they're egging her on. And listen to her response. She echoes something that was said already in chapter 2, verse 16, where in verse 3 of this chapter, she says, I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He who pastures his flock among the lilies. See, she's saying, you need not concern yourself with where he is. Nothing has changed. I'm still his, and he is still mine. She's echoing this from chapter 2, verse 16, where it first said, my beloved is mine, and I am his. Notice she put him first in the earlier chapter, and then her second. It's because he loved her first, and now she understands how to give the love back to him right here in chapter 6. This is speaking to her, her identity, and she's firm in it. She's saying, listen, in the midst of this separation, I'm not even sure if he's hearing me. I'm not even sure if he still wants me, but I am sure that I am his and he is mine in the midst of this uh, separation. And sometimes we feel like we aren't even sure if Christ hears us. We feel like we're so separated. I, at least I... I looked at myself as, as this when the Lord first started dealing with me, and I'm, I wasn't even sure, and I'm praying, and I'm praying, but I'm hearing people say, yeah, the Lord told me this, and the Lord told me that, but I wasn't hearing anything until I came to a p bit of truth that I'm going to get to in a little while longer, but she's firm in a, in a little while later, but she's firm and confident in what she's saying. Yes, in the midst of this storm, I know who I am. And it's not the cocky and arrogant and prideful type of boldness that she's displaying, but it's the submissive, confident, and reinsured type of submissiveness that creates this boldness that she's able to say, I know who I am. To me, this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, where the scripture says, therefore, let, the scripture says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, without wavering, without doubt. For he who promised is faithful. This is her saying, listen, in the midst of this storm that I'm going through, nothing has changed, at least on his end. It may feel like that, it may seem like that, but I'm sure that nothing has changed between our relationship. So you can just be gone, women of Jerusalem. Nothing has changed. He's mine. We have this confidence because of who he is, not because of who we are. And it's because of who he is that we are who we are right now. Hebrews 4, 16. This, here's, here's another reason that we should therefore let our, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace for our time, for help at the time of our need. See, she needed help. She, she called out a search party. I don't know where he is. Can you help me? I liken that to, to going to intercessors. Hey, can you pray with me? This is during the midst of this separation. You know, there's all sorts of doubts going through her head, but she still stands firm. She's holding firm to the hope and the promise of who she is. And she's confident in this. Here's another reason why we can be confident. The second part of Hebrews 13 and 5, it says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things that, as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you 
nor forsake you. That scripture right there is a scripture that took me out of me thinking that I was too bad for God and he didn't want me anymore. It took the, it took the doubt of, uh, and the thoughts that was creeping into my head of saying, oh, now you want to come follow me? Those were real things that were coming to me over 40 some years. Oh, now you want to come to me? Oh, now you want to come and open the door to your heart? Those are real thoughts that were trickling into my head. But then this scripture, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I replaced that lie with this truth right here. And that brought me into confidence and boldly being able to say, I know who I am now. I know exactly who I am. But see, notice that it says in Hebrews 13, 13, 5, excuse me, for he himself has said, he has said. It doesn't say that he will say, he'll say it soon in the future. He has said, which means he said it already, which means that we are reading an echo. And it's an echo from Deuter Deuteronomy 31 and 8, where he said, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. Do not fear and do not be dismayed. That's an echo of something that he said already. It's the echo of love that rekindles the heart. It brings you to assurance. It brings you to this confidence. It brings you to this boldness of who you are. It's your identity in Christ, in Christ. And if we can take it a step further, we're back at Hebrews Hebrews 13 and 8, where it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's it. He's not going to change. There's nothing you can do that can change how he feels about you. He's already made this statement. He came and died for you so that you can be clean. But you got to come to him. You got to come to him so he can clean you up. Even with all our mess, we got to come to him. We got to open the door of our hearts so he can come in and clean up everything. And he can love you so he can show you how to return the love. So he can show you how to echo the love so you can rekindle some hearts out there. This is how we have to come boldly to the throne. And when we refuse to come boldly to the, to the throne, we deprive ourselves of what we need. We deprive ourselves of the privileges and the things that were bought for us on the cross. But let's jump back to Solomon. Here's why she's bold in her saying that she is his and he, and he is hers. Because at verse 4 through 6, he says, Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Terza, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me. He's back to the eyes. For they have overcome me. Your hair, your hair is like a flock of goats going down from the Gilead. And your teeth, back on the teeth, are like a flock of sheep which have come up from the washing. And everyone bears twins, which means he, she has all of them, and none is barren among them. See, he's saying the same thing from chapter four, not just to remind her of these things, but he's reiterating, he's reconfirming that, hey, listen, nothing has changed. I still see you the way that I saw you then. So instead of saying something new, he says the exact same thing. I still love you. I'm still in love with you. To me, this is Colossians 1, 21 and 22, and it's where it says, and you, 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 who once were alienated in your mind and enemies in your mind, that's the separation right there. At one point in time, we were enemies against God. We didn't know what he wanted for us or his will for us. We were aliens to what his will was in our minds by wicked works. What are the wicked works in the garden? The serpent saying, did God really say? That's the wicked work that he's talking about right there. Yet now, right now, he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you, oh, listen to this, to present you holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. In his sight, above reproach means he's not ashamed of you. He's not disappointed. He doesn't see you all in your mess. He sees you how he created you. You have to come and let him clean you up. Of course, if you continue in the faith, continue in the faith means you have to continue to be faithful to him so he can be faithful to you. 
But you got to come. See, you have to see yourself the way he sees you and all of your mess and all of your addictions and you doing this and doing that. That's not of God. He doesn't see you in that way. He, he doesn't blame you for that. He blames the devil, which is why the devil is defeated already. But you, he has to show you the truth so that you can come so, and be cleaned up by him. That's the only way. That's the only way. The doctor doesn't come to you, you gotta come to the doctor. But our doctor's standing at the door knocking. He's knocking. And if that wasn't good enough, let's look at verse eight and nine. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins or young women without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one of who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. He got so many to choose from, but there's one. There's one. You. He's talking about you, Terry. He's talking about you, Barry. You, Ralph. Lise, Matt, Frank, I see. He's talking about you. He's talking about your uniqueness. He's talking about everything that you're dealing with. He's talking about, I still love you, even with everything that goes on with you. If you're angry, I can deal with that. He's saying that. He can deal with that. You're depressed, he can deal with that. You can come to me. He left the 99 for the one. He's saying he loves you. You, Josh, Pastor Roger, he loves each and every one of us separately and individually. Each and every one of you, he's calling you. You see what this book does? It calls you. It's, it's a personal love story. You can make this book a personal love story for yourself, between you and your Lord and Savior, between you and God. This is what this is. This is how this book should speak to you. It's the echo of love that's going to rekindle your heart. When he finds you and you, you, you're, that, you're that missing piece, you're the, you're the kindred spirit, you're the gem that he's been looking for. And in that moment, oh, heaven's going to rejoice. Heaven's going to be so glad that the word is working in you. Worked in you. You're a great discovery. Because we all once were lost and now we're found. See, there's a reason why the relationship with Christ is called a marriage. We know a marriage is an intimate relationship. It's, it's meant to be a really exclusive and close relationship. It's transparent. It's, it's an open relationship in terms of communication. And you should be able to share everything with, with your significant other. It's exclusive, lifelong covenant. And God created it. It's, it's the two becoming one. And this is what Solomon's trying to tell us, that the marriage should be celebrated. It should be enjoyed. It should be revered. It's, the, it's one of the best relationships that we can have outside of our relationship with God himself. He created it. Now, I would be remiss to, to leave this part out. Because of this, because God has created it, Satan comes and tries to destroy it. Because your marriage is a target of warfare simply because God created it and he hates it he doesn't dislike it he hates it he see that Ron and Terry has been together so long and even with all this stuff look at these two lovebirds trying to be all in love I hate that that's Satan he ain't playing no games he is not playing no games he hates it. And so he tries to make a mockery out of everything that God has created. Everything. Which is why our world is confused about what marriage is today. He's confused by what the devil does because God is not the author of confusion, right? This prevalence of, of divorce and modern attempts to redefine what the marriage is and what it stands for is meant to be in blatant contrast of this book of Solomon and how God created it. Period. But the Song of Songs is, tries, it tries, is meant to focus on this intimate relationship again. God already stated that he loves us. So how do we return the love back to him? 
That's why this is the Love Returned series. We want to see how do we return the love back to him? What, what can we give him? How do we, how do we give, what do we give somebody that has everything? One thing we can do is to give him the thing that's most precious to us, our life. Amen. Your life. Your life is the most precious thing that you have. And honestly, it's all that we have to give him. We have to live devoted. We have to live devoted lives to him, through him, because of him. That's how we return this love back to him. He said, come and follow me. Come and follow me. This has to be a daily routine submitted to him. And love is every single day when you wake up and your conscious mind be, becomes conscious that, oh, I'm awake now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and letting me see a brand new day. I thank you, Father, it's because of your mercy that I'm awake and it wasn't my alarm clock. We thank him for each and every moment, for freeing us from, from the life that we once lived. And this, Paul reminds us in his writings that freedom in Christ does two things. It's to both free us from something in order to be free for something. We're free to receive the love of Christ right now. Will you give the love back? That's the question. Are you ready to answer the call? Because he's knocking at your, he's knocking on the door of your heart. Will you answer that? It's important. It's important that we make this a daily routine to continually go to the Father for each and everything. When times are good, when times are bad, it's a routine. We have to, we have to do routine things routinely. In other words, we have to be frequent and consistent with this. It has to be second nature. Here's what the commentator Matthew Henry said. Our communion and fellowship with God is very much maintained and kept up by the frequent renewing of our covenant with him and rejoicing in it. It's every day just, just loving the fact that Again, you know, you woke me up again today, Lord. I don't know what's on the agenda, but I can't wait for it. I'm ready for it because I know that you're with me. And no matter what happens today, I know that you're going to get me through this. No matter what. And I found this, uh, this I guess, this description or diagram of a, a married couple, a man and woman. And Juan and I, we're working on this part, but... You know, the marriage between a man and a woman, it's, it's way better when they're closer to God. Amen. And if you notice on the diagram that when they're further away from God, they are more separate. So the closer they are to God, the closer they are together, and the further they are from God, the further they are from each other. God is the glue. God is the glue in any relationship. In every relationship, we're talking about a marriage here, and you know, the the marriage, the marriages only really work with God being the glue. And it's not just about people who are married. If you're not married and you're single, your relationship with Him, your relationship with Him can be just the same. Your relationship with Him means you're never alone. At one point, at ever ever in your life, if your relationship is solid with God the Father through Christ, you're rock solid and you're never alone. You're never alone. So it's not just about a physical relationship. It's also, it starts with a spiritual relationship. You're never alone. But will you answer the call? Have you answered the call? That's the question. You can ask yourself, you're hearing my voice today, but I believe you're hearing the word of God. Will you answer the call? This is Revelations 3 and 20. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice, hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. He's at the door. He's at the door of your heart today. He's standing there. He's waiting for you to open the door without any, 
anything in the way. With the walls, tear your walls down. Open up the door to him. Let him come in. No matter, no matter what you're going through, he's, he's here to clean up anything that you're going through. Will you open the door? Will you answer the call? So you can go away with him. So no matter if you're here, if, if, if you're here and you don't know Christ, if you're watching on the live stream or maybe watching a replay of this service, it's, it's no coincidence that, that you're hearing this message. I don't believe in coincidences. There's a reason why you're here today. And if you feel like you don't know Christ, say it in your own words. You say this in your own words. And I'm saying say it in your own words so it's your sincerity. And you're not just repeating what I'm about to say. Lord, come into my heart. I'm a sinner, but now I'm ready to repent. Come in. Clean me up, Lord. I open my heart to you so we can commune and dine together, Lord. And if that was you and you said that today, even if, even if you've been walking with the Lord and you need, a, you need a renewal of vows, if you will, you say those things. You say that every day if you have to. I recommit, Lord. I'm yours today, tomorrow, forever. I thank you, Lord, for choosing me and calling me. Reconnect. Recommit your, uh, your relationship with him each and every day. It's the frequency. It's the consistency in your walk with Christ. This is how you return the love back. In a marriage or any relationship, you know, it, it, once you get them, you got to keep them. Right? It's the same here. You be faithful to him, he'll continue to be faithful with you. That's the only way you're going to get through this life. Amen? So echo the love of Christ. It'll rekindle the heart of somebody that you're going to come across today. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father, for touching hearts and minds around the world. It is you. It is because you echoed your love on the cross through your son that we are who we are today. And I believe that no matter what we deal with, Father, you are the way through because you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. And I just thank you, and I believe that hearts and minds are touched here today, Lord. And I just bless, I ask that you bless and continue to bless each person here and, and anyone that comes across this message, Father, that, that you will bring them and soften their hearts and they will come to open the door. Open the door so that you can come in and dine with us, with them, Lord. And I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Be blessed. The altar is open if anybody needs to come up for prayer or anything. God. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the service and you want to learn more about the ministry, head over to the website at praisetabernacle.church where you can learn about all the ministries Praise has to offer. Find devotional content, weekly newsletters from the pastors, and much more. We hope to see you soon right here at Praise Tabernacle because we are people restored and inspired serving everywhere.